All right, but let's talk Sid Shots. Okay, so I consider today's topic one of my two most valuable creations, things that I made up that, I've bring to, that I'm bringing to the world. And I say with only partly joking, I'm, I'm, the next slide is gonna be an overstatement, but only partly joking, I say that this is one of the greatest and simplest contributions to humanity of our time. I seriously, okay, I'm overstating a little bit, but I do believe that. I think that this is something, this, the concept of the Sid Child is something that everyone can do, doesn't cost anything, it's very simple, and it really changes your life. It's about doing what you want in life. And to give you some context for me, oh, and I should say free of distraction, it keeps you focused on what's important to you and gets you to put stuff that's not important to you away. So without pride or shame, I'm gonna list some things that I've done. If, if you read my bio, you know these things, but I'll just mention them in the context of getting things done, which is what a Sid Shot is about. I have a PhD, I have an MBA, both from Columbia and Ivy League School. I've been quoted or profiled in, in tons of media, like every broadcast, lots of print, lots of magazines. I swam across the Hudson, I studied under Nobel laureate, I've run six marathons, I've competed at nationals and worlds. I've been in 26 countries and six continents. In the past couple of years, I've spoken at Harvard, Princeton, MIT, Columbia, all these different places. Uh, and that's material stuff that I've achieved. Besides that, I can also tell you that I don't know anybody who enjoys their life more than I enjoy mine. You know, I get angry sometimes, but generally life is really good. I live in the neighborhood that, is the, that I wanna live in more than anyone else, than any other place in the world, which is the West Village. I eat every day, I eat as much delicious and healthy food as I can, and yet I still have to find abs. Is that too much information? I'm not sure, but it's, it's really delicious and I love it And because I write it about a bunch. The people that I, that I work with are Ivy and elite people in Ivy and elite institutions. I write for Inc.com. I coach executives, all sorts of things like that. And what I want to talk about is what will make you the most productive. What I believe of all the things that I've done and all the things that I could do, I'm going to talk about what I believe will help you become the most productive you can be and to achieve your equivalent of all of those things. And I wanna say, a lot of people, they say, they look at all these things that I do and they say, well, you must be very disciplined, especially when I talk about the things that I do daily, like the exercise that I do daily and the writing that I do daily. And a lot of people think, well, Josh, you must be very, very disciplined. You must have a lot of dedication. And they think that that leads to the action. So many people think dis if you have discipline, if you're born with discipline, then you'll get a lot done. But I put to you that it's the opposite that if you do the action, then you develop the discipline. The question is, what action do you do? You don't just do randomly do stuff. Sitting around eating cookies and ice cream is some action, but it's not gonna give you discipline. Today, we're gonna to talk about what gives you the discipline. And I should say, some of the things that I listed happened before I discovered the Sid Shaw. Some of that stuff goes back to college. But if you look at the rate of progress, it's been much greater since. And not only is the progress happening more, I do more with less effort and more enjoyment than ever before. And that happens more all the time. So right now when I get things done, I get bigger things done. I enjoy what I'm doing more and I don't have to put, it, it's just, you know, it's just better. Okay, so I wanna go back to with the early beginnings of this concept. And I hope that by sharing it, you'll get, that you'll see that you can develop it too. So there's a picture of my blog. And I'm gonna talk about when I first started my blog at the very beginning, I just had a regular blog. And I wrote on it maybe, I don't know, once every couple of months, I put a few ideas up. And a friend of mine looked at it and said, Josh, you should really switch some of the software. And he blogged and he said, uh, he set me up. And when I was after he set me up, I said, by the way, how often do you post? Do you post like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, whenever you feel like a post? Is it on work days? And he said to me something that has stuck with me ever since. He said, he posts every day. And he said, if you miss one day, you can miss two. If you miss two, it's all over. And we all know that there are lots of blogs out there that post for a while, and then you see like a missed day, and then eventually people just stop writing. I was worried when I started, first started blogging, am I gonna run out of ideas? I thought, maybe I'll, maybe I'll only have 10 or 20 or 50 ideas in me, and then I'll run out of stuff to say. On the contrary, I quickly started realizing, I started coming up with more posts and more ideas for posts the more that I wrote. It was the opposite. Writing developed the skill of coming up with ideas. And so now I haven't missed a day in over five years. I've posted just over 2,100 posts now. And I still like I have a list of blog post ideas and it's still building faster now than ever before. I'm throwing away better and better ideas because yet better ideas are still there for me to write about. 
Okay, so that was the first thing I did that was something that I did every day without fail. So now I wanna talk about another story. It might sound like a different thing, but you'll see how it connects. So this was one December in 2011. I, I read an article where the writer of the article contacted a bunch of fitness experts and asked them if you could name one exercise and one exercise only to, the, to be the best single exercise, what would be, what would it be? And so they went out a bunch, asked a bunch of fitness people. And the first answer they came up with was the butterfly swim stroke. And they said that, um, uh, and they said that it's a great full body exercise. There's one problem though, or a couple of problems. You need a swimming pool and it's really hard to do. So most people can't really learn to do it. So they said the next one was the burpee. And I'd never heard of a burpee before. I didn't know what it was. So for you looking at the screen right now, you can see someone doing the steps of a burpee. And so I read about them after reading this article and I found out that a burpee is like a pretty good all around exercise. It's named after some guy named Burpee uh, who named it as a fitness exercise something like hundred years ago. Anyway, the article then said, but who would really do burpees and only burpees? And they decided, they eventually settled on walking, I guess, because anyone with legs at work can walk and you don't need any equipment. Anyway, so a few days or maybe a week later, I was having drinks with a friend on my rooftop and we got talking about burpees and we were just talking about them. And the next day he emails me and he says, Josh, I, could, I couldn't even do 10 burpees. I could only do like, I forget the number, four or five, six. And so I read that email. I thought, oh, I wonder how many I could do. So I did burpee, I did 10 burpees. And I wrote him back to say, you know, to thank him for inspiring me because I did something I wouldn't have done otherwise. And as I was writing him, I thought, you know, this is a pretty good exercise. Let's do, and I wrote him and I said, let's do 10 burpees a day for the next 30 days. And we'll contact each other by email, phone, or text each day for 30 days. And he said, sure, let's do it. So over the course of the next 30 days, we both did 10 burpees each. Actually, we started at 10 each. And then soon after we switched to 11 and then 12 and then 13. And then one, at one point he had the idea to double. So he did one set in the morning and one set in the evening. So I did that too. And somewhere along the way, I thought this is a really good exercise. It doesn't take any equipment. It doesn't matter what the weather is. I don't need any special training. And I, some of the back of my mind, I was thinking maybe I should keep doing this for a while. And somewhere before the 30th day, I said, I'm gonna keep doing burpees forever. I'm not gonna stop doing burpees. I'm gonna keep doing them and keep doing them until I can't do them anymore. And since then, I haven't missed a day in over four years. So in December, I hit my fourth and starting into my fifth year. And anyone who knows me, I think people who know me know I write about burpees, I talk about burpees a lot. And so that was the next habit that I picked up that I started doing every single day. So now I'm gonna talk about cold showers. If you read my blog, you also see about cold showers sometimes. So there the story is that this is now about a year after I started doing the burpees every day. And a guy, his name is Joel Runyon, he found my blog and we got in touch over the internet and I went to his blog and I saw that his blog talked about something called cold shower therapy. And he, would, he was a proponent of taking cold showers every day. What happened with him was that he once, I'll give a bit of his story. And by the way, he has a TEDx talk that I recommend watching. So Joel Runyon, R-U-N-Y-O-N, uh, go there right after this webinar if you want. And he was living not the best life that he wanted for himself. He was like a delivery man for UPS or postal service. And he always wanted to start a company. Somehow he won a contest, I think, and he got to meet a very famous entrepreneur. I've never learned who this entrepreneur is, but he got to like have a lunch with this person. And the person said, Joel, after they were in the conversation, the guy said, Joel, it sounds like you really want to start a company. How come you haven't? I'm sure we can all relate to that. We've all have plans, more plans than we actually act on. And Joel gave him a bunch of reasons why he hadn't, you know, didn't have time, looking for more money, wanted more connections, you know, lots of different reasons. I'm sure we all know about reasons we have for not doing stuff that we are not doing. And this entrepreneur said something interesting to Joel. He said, I'll tell you why, you, or actually he asked him, he said, wait, can you explain again why you, why you haven't started a company? And Joel gave the same answers. And the entrepreneur said to Joel, I'll tell you why you haven't started your company. Tomorrow morning, take a cold shower. Which confused Joel because what's the point of taking a cold shower? What does that have to do with, with uh, starting a company? And so 
He said, well, whatever, I'll do it. So the next morning, you know, they finished the conversation. The next morning, Joel gets up and he's like, all right, I'll take a cold shower. No big deal. Anyone can do that. So as he's walking over to the shower, he's thinking, no big deal. I'll do it. No problem. And as he reaches for the cold shower knob, as he's reaching for it, suddenly his head fills with all this stuff. Like I can do it later tomorrow. I need more practice. I blah, blah, blah. And the reasons may have been slightly different, but basically the same stuff going through his head, the same stuff went through his head then as he gave his answer to this entrepreneur. And Joel realized that he was his own obstacle. And he said, I'm going to take this cold shower. I'm going to get past all these excuses. And then while having taken the cold shower, he would be able to start the company. And so later on, it wasn't, take, it wasn't long before things started turning around for him. He's got a big, he's become successful. Okay, so I read this and I watch that video. And this happens to be some December, a few years ago. And uh, I read that stuff and then I start scrolling down. He's got hundreds and hundreds of responses from other people and all these other people writing about how cold showers have changed your lives. Cold showers have done these amazing things. Like, like people will say, I started taking cold showers and I've lost 20 pounds. I'm like, how does a cold shower mean losing weight? So as I'm reading, first I'm thinking, this is really cool. I should do this someday. And then as I keep reading, I'm thinking, this is really along the lines of what I do. It's a bigger change than I expected. And then as I keep reading, I'm thinking, I should do this really soon. And then at one point, I just turn around, walk to the bathroom, turn on the cold shower, and took my first cold shower, which, by the way, by Joel's standards, means five minutes minimum. So, you know, I set the timer on my phone and set that to go off in five minutes. And I took a five-minute cold shower. December in, in New York City meant it was really cold. But when I finished, I was invigorated. All right, I'm not going to try to sell you guys on taking cold showers. That's, an, that's a topic for another seminar or webinar. But I'll tell you, it was a really great experience. I really enjoy it. And I realized that it was really like when you finish a cold shower, you are invigorated. You feel great. So I decided, all right, I'll do 30 days of cold showers. So I took cold showers for 30 days. And by the way, they, were, they started work on my apartment in that time. So I had to stay, I was staying at my sister's place, which meant the drafty guest room in the basement where I had to take cold showers in a cold bathroom. And if you don't mind me going off a bit off the off uh, off topic, or just bragging a little bit, maybe is that it was right after I finished those thirty days. There was this thing that if if those of you in New York might remember, there was this um, polar vortex thing where the temperatures dropped really low, and I got really cold water. Okay, so going back anyway, so I've taken cold showers. I've, I you know when I was taking them, I thought I really want to do these forever, like I'm doing with the burpees and the writing. But cold showers is pretty tough every single day, and I do like hot showers. And so I went back in, in my head and thought, what's the right amount? So I've decided to do cold showers every fourth day. Now, since four, every fourth day doesn't fit with seven days in a week, the way I do it is every day that, where the day of the month divides is divisible by four. So today's the 27th, tomorrow's the 28th. 27 doesn't, four doesn't go into that, uh, but it does go into 28th. So tomorrow I'm taking a cold shower. Then it's the 29th, so I get five days before my next one. Anyway, this is me talking about cold showers because I, I talk about them a lot. Okay, so I noticed a pattern while I was in the shower. The pattern was that there was something like in taking a cold shower that was something like meditation. And I don't mean overtly because one is you're standing up and you're wet and the other is you're sitting still and you're usually in a dark room or something like that. So. But I have meditated and I do know people who meditate daily and it seemed like there was something similar. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized it wasn't just like meditating, it was like lifting weights. I know people who lift weights every day. And it seemed like there was something common in there. Also people who play instruments every day. It kept seeming like there was something really similar in all these things. And so what was that pattern? And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, what? All right, obviously you're playing an instrument, you have an instrument. Taking a cold shower, there's no instrument. Lifting weights, you're at the gym, you're, or you're lifting heavy things. There, it's easy to spot the differences, but what are the similarities? What was the pattern? And so I picked up a few elements of what made these things similar. So one was that it was self-imposed. You had to choose to do these things. So a job, going to work every day, that's, you know, if you're going to lose your apartment otherwise, it doesn't really feel like it's a challenging thing that's going to help you learn and grow in the way that lifting weights or meditation or yoga or playing an instrument or singing or dancing, things that people do like this. Next was that it was daily. 
Daily meant a couple things. The one I wrote here is that it meant that you couldn't skip it when it was hard. It's like it's hard lifting weights all the time or any time, but it's really hard on a day when you're really sore from something before or you press for time or something like that. And when you can't skip it, it means you have to do it when it's really hard. I can tell you doing burpees, some days it's really hard. Like you come home late, you just want to go to sleep, or maybe you've had a few drinks or you've eaten a really big dinner, it's really hard. Making it daily means you can't skip that. The other thing about making it daily is that it's easy to keep up. You don't have to keep track. And if you have to keep track of stuff and you're trying to keep spreadsheets and all these things, it makes there's another element that distracts from the core thing of what you're doing. Okay, the next is it has to be challenging. You know, sitting and reading the paper every day, brushing your teeth, these don't seem like they really lead to, I mean, brushing your teeth obviously keeps your teeth clean. It's good for hygiene, but I don't feel like it leads to personal growth in the way that meditation and yoga and singing do. So if it's too easy, it doesn't really count. It has to be healthy, so that it makes you a better person for having done it. So smoking cigarettes is just not gonna cut it for this. It has to be healthy. And it has to be active, an activity, not passive. As best I could tell, like sitting and reading just doesn't seem to me, I mean, you have to define for yourself what counts as active or not. Because meditation, I think, is active. It's sitting still, but it's kind of hard to sit still. That's not kind of hard. I find it hard to sit still for long enough. So I think that you know, meditation counts for me. Reading, I don't think, counts for me. But you can figure out for yourself what counts for you. And so I put all these things together. And I saw self-imposed daily challenging healthy activity, reading down there on the left, S-I-D-C-H-A, became the concept of Sidcha. And I thought to myself, this is a really interesting concept. And I think it's really useful. All these different things are all Sidchas. They are all self-imposed daily challenging healthy activities. And so here's this diagram that shows all these different things in life. The Sidcha is what's in, I mean, in, if you look at this, you see exercise, education, diet, business, adventure, art and music, all of these things, all these categories of life are areas where you can do stuff that improves you, that makes you a better person, that makes you grow, things like that. If you look at what's common to all of them, that's what I think the Sidcha is, the self-imposed, daily, challenging, healthy activity. That's that center of the whole Venn diagram. And if you pick something in all of there, you get the benefits that are, I think, the core benefits of all of those different things. I mean, if you do burpees, it's not going to help you play a musical instrument, but the, I'll tell you in a second what the benefits you get are. Actually, here, I'm gonna tell you now, what each different Sidcha, like playing an instrument gives you musical ability and expressive ability, but what's common to all Sidchas? If you do any Sidcha, it gives you the following. And I should say, I'm gonna tell you these things in words. And those of you who do something like play a musical instrument or sing or dance or, and do these things all the time regularly, you know what I'm talking about. You're gonna feel it in your bones. But if you don't, only experience will give you the understanding of what happens when you do these things. This is, of Sitcha is a purely experiential thing. People who know me know that I'm not a big fan of abstract learning without attaching it to experiential learning, active learning. I don't like passive learning. So when you do these things, you really get this feeling, the following. So first, I say in quotes, superficially, what they give you, and I think this is the, the first biggest thing that they give you, is that they give you discipline dedication and structure in your life. Now, if you're an entrepreneur like me, you don't have a job, a nine to five setting the structure for your life. And so you have to create structure for yourself. But I, I, mean, it's, I mean this at a more basic level. The more structure that you have, the more that you can build, almost in an architectural sense, if you're like architecting your life, the more foundation you have, the more solid foundation you have, the more you can build. And discipline, dedication, and structure are what give you that platform to build on. I used to say, I used to think of as Sid Chaz as like a platform to build your life on, but increasingly I think of them as bedrock. They're like the bedrock to build on. Bedrock, a platform you can kind of stand on. Bedrock you can build the Empire State Building on. So that's the top level thing that Sid Chaz get, but there's a lot more. First of all, lack of Sid Chaz after you've done Sid Chaz for a while makes it makes you feel like you're running in sand, like you push hard, but you don't really get that far, or swimming in molasses. And I don't just mean running in sand, swimming in molasses on a particular project, but in life. That's what happens when you have these things, you just, the lack of them, you can understand why people spiral out of control sometimes if they don't have a structure to keep them making things work for them, that bedrock to put the rest of their life on. The next is the value of tricks. What I mean here is that a lot of people Say you want to lift weights, say you want to build muscle, 
a lot of people look at like Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the day, or still today, as far as I can tell, as like they look at him and they say, he goes to the gym all the time. He likes going to the gym. It's easy for him to go to the gym because he just likes it. And they think to themselves, if I also liked it like he did, then I would also go to the gym like he did, and then it would be easier. And they're waiting for them to get hit by this desire or passion or something that is they don't have, but other people do. And they're like, I wish that I had that too. The thing is that challenges are not easy for anyone. I haven't met Arnold yet, but I believe if you asked him, if I asked him, was it easy to go to the gym? I bet he would say, no, it was never easy to go to the gym. Challenges aren't easy for anyone. I think that every, when I do my burpees, I always have this little trick that I don't say I'm gonna do 26 burpees. I say, I'm gonna do not even one burpee. I say, I'm just gonna do this little jump to start me off. And even though that little jump is less than, it's like what, less than a percent of all the calories that I burn, it gets me started. And once I'm started, I'm in the mode of doing burpees. So I finish the burpees. I'm sure a lot of people have little tricks like that for people who have successful habits in their lives. A lot of people I know who go to the gym a lot, they don't tell themselves they're gonna to go to the gym for a two hour workout. They tell themselves they're just gonna to go to the gym and walk in the front door. Now, once they're in there, they stay for another two hours, but everyone has these little tricks. Now, I, I only know myself and all the, actually all the people I've talked to about this, but I believe Arnold has them too. And I believe everyone who's done do these things have tricks. And so you learn the value of tricks. You learn to do what you say. If I say I'm gonna do burpees, I do my burpees. Now my identity is wrapped up in them enough that if I didn't do them, I'd feel really, really bad. But the thing is that when you say you're going to do something and you do it enough times, it gets a lot easier to do it later in other things in life. I'm sure a lot of, oh man, it annoys me so much when people say yes to things that they don't know if they're able to do, or they later tell me, I can't, oh, you know, I'm oversubscribed. I can't really do that thing that I said I was going to do. I get annoyed when people are like that with me. I hope that people are annoyed if I'm like, with, like that with them, but I'm less and less like that. I don't think I'm like that at all now. I might be, as far as I know, I'm not. In any case, compared to before, much less. And so to be able to do what you say, I don't need to tell you the value of that. I think the greatest value that you get from doing burpees, and again, this is experiential, but I think the greatest value is someone came, I was telling someone about burpees a little while ago, and he said, well, obviously you don't do them when they're really hard, when you're really exhausted. Like if it's a really difficult day or you've been doing too much at work and you just want to rest. He said, he didn't even ask me. He just said, like, obviously you don't do them in that situation. And I said, especially when you're exhausted. I tend to think of the burpees that I do when I'm full of energy and they're not hard to do. Those are like the practice ones. Those are the ones that set up the structure. It's the ones that I do when it's really hard. Those are the ones that build character, that build identity, that build you to be the person that you can be and that enable you and give you the skill in every other part of life to do what you want to do, to do what you want to, and, and be free from distraction from other things. So for example, just recently while I was making these slides, Thursday night, today's what, Sunday. So Thursday night, a couple of nights ago, class, my class goes until 8.45. I'm teaching an evening class and the class stayed late. And then a couple of students came and had a whole bunch of answer, uh, questions. And then I had a little bit of uh, stuff to follow up. So by the time I got home, it was something like 10.30. I had a 6.30 a.m. meeting the next day. I hadn't had dinner yet. I was tired, I was fatigued. So I had to eat. I had to like, you know, do my routine before going to sleep, but I also had my burpees. And I think, come to think of it, I also have my blog. Now the blog isn't so hard to write. I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot of energy, but it does take time. But I did not want to do burpees then. When I, when I mean I didn't want to intellectually, I wanted to do them, but my bones, I just didn't want to. Emotionally, I did not feel like doing burpees. I would much rather have gone to sleep right away. I still did my burpees. Now, that's not the hardest time in the world to do them, but it's like you get in the habit of doing them. And then in the rest of life, when you're, I don't know, you're at some meeting and you want to bring up some topic and you're scared to bring it up because you're not sure how people are going to respond and maybe they're going to think you're an idiot or something like that. If you believe it's the right thing to do, you do it. Because every single day, or for me with my burpees, twice, twice a day, I, do, I, I say I'm going to do it and I do it. And it develops that skill. To give you a, a bigger picture, when I did the marathon, my most recent marathon was my, my first one after starting burpees. And obviously running 26.2 miles is a lot harder than teaching class until 10.30 p.m. I still did my 52 burpees. Actually, I did this, you know, I did this little fun thing. I knew the marathon would be it's on a Sunday morning. So Saturday, I wanted to have as much time to recover. So I did my 
two sets of burpees on the Saturday before the marathon, just after midnight, so I, as early as I possibly could. And then I did my two sets on Sunday after the marathon. They were really hard. That was probably the longest set, longest time it took me to finish two sets of burpees, but I did them. And that's when you, re, that's when you learn what you're capable of. So talking about cold showers, during that polar vortex, after I finished those 30 days, I knew the water was going to be as cold as it could be. I went for my personal best, and I got, it was 39.9 degrees Fahrenheit. Was, so that's like, what, four or five degrees Celsius, something like that. And five minutes, fingertips purple. It's hitting your head. It's like the water is like, it's painful. But, you know, the risk of injury is basically zero. As soon as I turn the water off, the feeling goes away. You know, as bad as it was, you know, it's, 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 you just realize these things pass. It's not that big of a deal. And there's so many things in life that are easier to do than to walk into a stream of 39.9 degree water. And when you've done that, there's so many other things you can do. So that's why I call this stuff such a great value. Moving on to other things. I do nearly all my sidchas completely alone. No one knows that I do these burpees. I could not do them and nobody would know. I mean, I guess you could tell in my behavior, but you wouldn't know what was the difference in behavior. I'd be less, I'd have less structure in my life. So what does it mean there's a word for when you do things what, when no one else can tell, and that word is integrity. And so sidchas build integrity, especially ones that, are, that no one can tell whether you're doing them or not. Because you're the one who's getting yourself to do them, it means you take on responsibility. It gives you the ability to assert yourself because you say and do what you want to say and do. You become accountable to yourself, and that means you are accountable. And accountability and responsibility are two of the most important elements of leadership, whether leading yourself or leading others. When I was a kid growing up, I wanted to avoid responsibility. I didn't like accountability. I wanted none of those things because I wanted to be able to slack. But when you're leading yourself and you're leading others, you want accountability. You want responsibility. And these give you the skills to do them. And simplicity. Another big thing is when you create that structure, you know how your life works. You don't have to keep track of lots of things. It's easy for me to go when I'm going to sleep. Did I do my burpees? No, do them. When I wake up, I just do my burpees before my before a shower. And it, it creates a simplicity that, I don't know, I don't see in a lot of people who don't have that structure. Another big thing is that you share your passion. People, I talk about these things a lot because I'm passionate about these things. And when I meet someone who also does cold showers, who also does any SID shot, any daily thing, any self-imposed daily challenging healthy activity. We bond on that. So you share your passion. And when you do that, you attract those who share the passion with you, which means that you have more people in your life that you like and that you can, you can grow and learn from each other. Is that a bubble? Not necessarily. I'm not saying it's people who agree with you. They just have a passion they share with you. They may disagree with you on lots of things. You can still grow from them. And equally as important, in order to give you time to spend with the people that you share these passions with, you repel those who don't share that passion with you. I really have a lot fewer people in my life who don't have integrity, who don't have responsibility, who don't hold themselves accountable. And so the people in my life are ones who do. It gives you self-awareness. And I wanna say specifically where that self-awareness comes from. It comes from the physical and mental patterns revealing the nuances of thought and behavior. When you do the same thing every single day, you know how you feel before you start, when you're doing them, as you get tired, as you recover, you know that feeling and you be and if you don't have that structure you feel like your your thoughts and your behavior patterns are all different all the time but when you hold something constant you can pick up all these little nuances that you wouldn't pick up if you're not every day consistent like that form you know i don't recommend waiting until you have perfect form to start sidchas i don't recommend if you want to learn how to play a musical instrument, you don't have to know how to play it perfectly before you start. So when I, if I looked at my burpees at the beginning, I think my, my push-ups are probably not very effective. But now, not every single one, but generally, my thighs, hips, chest, chin, and nose all hit at virtually the same time. I think that's really good form. And I do it like someone once said, Josh, you look like a machine when you're doing these. I think that I hit the form that is the most effective and that's what happens when you do things over and over again. And you don't need other people to help with this stuff. You can you, you know when you can improve your form. And only when you do them consistently, consistently, consistently does that work out. Or can you really improve it? Concentration, just like awareness, 
It comes from doing things over and over again. You know what you're focusing on. For another thing, like I throw in stretching after my burpees and stretching is like I hold that for a while. Actually, I don't like using other equipment, so I just, I don't do it by a clock. How long do I stretch for? I do it for 60 breaths. So that means after my burpees, I'm breathing really fast. I'm panting. And so I get down and I start doing my stretches and that's a great time for concentration. Just 60 breaths of focus and concentration. Patience, you gotta do these every day. Patience, I think that's a given. Another big thing that is a big change in my life, someone like me who has a PhD, who was very analytical most of his life, who valued intellectual learning most of his life, I've switched on that. I much value action over thought. Here's a quote from uh, when I took acting lessons. I took a movement class and these words were incredible. He said, if you're thinking, you're not moving. And if you're not moving, you're not making progress, literally and figuratively. And these sitchas require activity, so it gets you to move. And if you're not moving, you're, it's really hard to make progress without moving. Another big one is the skill to start habits easily. I don't count, you know, after I'd started maybe the burpees, I don't know about you, I, this is too much information, whatever, but I didn't floss very consistently for most of my life. And one day I said, you know, I started burpees, no problem. I'm just gonna start flossing. From now on, I'm gonna floss every day. And I've never missed my flossing. I don't call it a sit shot because I don't think it's particularly challenging, but something that I wasn't able to do my whole life to make consistent, I've now made consistent, no problem. Save money. I haven't paid a penny for gym membership in a long time. I get consistent uh, comments about how I'm fit and questions about how to be fit and stuff like that. I never go to the gym. Burpees are really good exercise. I don't know what you wanna do, but uh, if you want to be fit or something like that, you don't have to do a physical sit child like that. But in my case, it's worked out pretty well that way. Long-term growth. As challenges become easy, I used to do 10 burpees a day. That's where I started. Now I do 52 a day, two sets of 26. Yeah, I did 10 burpees a day in 2011. And now I'm over five times more. That's growth. That's development. I could not do more than 10 before. Now 10 is like barely getting started. Oh, and did I say 52 burpees a day? And I do ab, do crunches and things like that after that. And I do back exercises because the burpees don't do a pull thing like that. So I do kind of like pull-ups and I do stretching. Why do I do all these other things? One, because I want to do stuff that burpees don't cover. And also because it became simpler and simpler because, I'm sorry, it didn't become simpler. The burpees were just as hard. I became stronger, physically, emotionally, mentally stronger. And so if something's easy, that once was hard, I move on to make it more challenging. Okay, enough talk. I've been talking for a while and you know me, I don't like to talk too, well, I do like to talk a lot, but I wanna make things interactive. So it's time for burpees. This is why I wrote loose fitting clothes for a reason. Here's what you're gonna learn in the session and I highlight here, wear loose fitting clothes, prepare to be active. Are we all ready to do a couple burpees? I'll take that as a yes. And here is a picture of what burpees are. I'm going to do, I'm going to step away from the computer in a minute. I'm going to do, I think I'll do five burpees. Now that doesn't reduce the number I'm going to do tonight. And it doesn't take away from the ones I did this morning. So everyone step away from your computer in a second. And you're going to start from standing up like the, like the picture on the left. You're going to put your hands down in front of your feet. You're going to kick your feet backward. If you can do a push up, do a push up, do the best you can. If your form is not great, that's fine. If you want to put your knees down and do it that way, that's fine. If you can't do a push up at all, just hold a plank for a half a second then jump your feet forward to by your hands. Now your hands, now, now your hands are right in front of your feet. Now let's jump up with your hands in the air. Does everyone get that? I hope so. Let's see, what's the next slide? Okay, how, oops, these slides are backward. How many? Enough to challenge, but not completely exhaust you. So I'll do five. I can do more than five, as you know, but if you wanna do one, two, that's fine. If you wanna do 10, that's fine, but do enough to challenge you, but not completely exhaust you. So there's the picture, so you know how to do it. I'm gonna step away from the computer and do five burpees. I'll be back in about 30 seconds. So enjoy your burpees. I'll see you in about 30 seconds. Maybe you can hear me panting. Okay, 
Not sure if everyone's done theirs yet, but I just did five burpees. I see someone that did six and not lose fitting clothing. Glad to see that. Actually, for some crazy reason, I wore my, my big engineering boots today. I guess because it's cold out. So I'm wearing he heavy boots, make it a lot harder. I'm talking a little bit now because I, there might be some people who are doing a few more burpees. So I'm gonna give them a chance to get back. I can feel my heart beating faster than it normally does. By the way, after you do burpees, like it's impossible to feel the rest of the day like you haven't done anything that day because you've done something pretty challenging. It feels really, I don't know about you, but it feels really good. Uh, the feeling of exhaustion after doing some exercise. And for those of you who did like more than five, more than 10, it's really, it's exhausting. It's a very good feeling of exhaustion. It's also a full body workout. If you go and look them up, you'll see how, how effective the workout is. And now I wanna point out, you have started your Sid Shah. You don't have to start doing burpees, but you can consider that this was the first day of all of, if you wanted to do burpees, you could say this is your first first burpee sitcha day. And day one, actually I went to this conference over the summer and we were, it was like pe people are going around the room talking about stuff, about their lives and things. And for some reason I started talking about burpees and how I do them every day. And I mentioned to the people that I do this stuff. And part of the, part of the, uh, part of that group was we were supposed to get each other's addresses and mail each other. Uh, just to keep up. And I told everyone in the group, I would be honored and flattered if instead of writing me soon after this conference, if you waited 30 days and wrote me then, and we, we had to write physical cards, which they distributed to us. I would love if you could write me in 30 days and tell me if you've done your, since now you did one day of burpees, do it. And so one guy, he took the, the card that he sent me and he wrote a calendar on the back. And if you search on my blog, you can find the picture of it because I scanned it or took a picture of it and put it up on my blog. And he did 30 burpees, or 30 days of burpees. And I, I love that feeling of knowing that I helped change something. So if you decide to do burpees as a Sid Shah, I recommend continuing with two fewer than you just did. If you did one, you gotta stick with one. If you did two, you gotta stick with one or two. But if you did more, I recommend, this is what I recommend to people, take two off of what was a challenge, you know, big challenge, and then go back to that. So if you did four just now, Go back and do two and do two forever. Eventually two will be easy for you and you'll do three. Eventually three will be easier and you'll do four. And then just keep doing that. And I'll, I'll talk more about how to pick up burpees in a, in a little bit. So I wanna give examples of other Sid shots. You don't have to do burpees. You don't have to do cold showers. They have a particular challenge that resonates with me, but they don't have to, re they don't resonate with everyone. I've never been, I haven't been particularly musical. So I didn't pick up playing a musical instrument. That might be another one. So let me give some examples. So in the realm of physical or exercise type ones, burpees I like, they don't require any equipment. They don't require any training. I've been doing them for a long time. I've never been injured. In fact, I've gotten other injuries and kept doing my burpees, injuries from other places. But you might wanna do just push-ups. You could run every day. You could do meditation every day. You could do yoga every day. Jumping jacks, jumping rope, lifting weights, cold shower, all these things are physical exercise ones. Social ones. You could talk to a new person every day, or you could find a reason to speak in public every day. I know people who have done these things. They could be expressive things or more artistical thing, art, artistical, artistic things. So for example, you could take 10 photographs every day. We all have cell phones, we can do that, it's very easy. So I also say, don't just take them, but find a way to show them, because I think that adds another element of putting yourself out there. I think it adds an extra challenge. You could draw a drawing every day. Actually, I, I met someone who, she was getting a master's degree in art because she wanted to become an artist. And I pointed out, you know, studying art in school is not the same thing as practicing art. And the more we talked, immediately after the conversation, she went to an art store and bought a pencil and some, uh, a, a bunch of pencils and a bunch of paper to do the, to, to start drawing because only drawing teaches you drawing. And it was the simplest thing that she could do. And I don't know, I haven't, I haven't found out. I believe that she's kept it up. Now I have to go and find out. Okay, you could paint a painting every day. You could sing a song every day. You could play an instrument every day. You can write a blog like I do every day. Or you could write a story every day. You know, my blogs aren't really stories. You could dance every day. You could act every day. Okay, so those are some examples of expressive. Health, you could cook a special meal every day. Man, how great would that be to cook yourself a gourmet meal every single day or a particularly healthy meal every day? Now, not just any meal but something you put something put more effort into, or you could garden every day. 
don't know if you can garden every day because in the winter, I don't know, gardening could be something that you could put in there. I'm not a gardener, so I can't really say for sure. Business. I know people who write a new business idea every day or who write five business ideas every day. You think maybe you'd run out of ideas? I predict on the contrary, you'll probably come up with more and more. Are they all ones that you could do? No, ideas are cheap. Execution is, is harder. But just writing them, writing the ideas every day, you'll get the skill of identifying problems and solving them or how to solve them. Okay, I wanna talk about some things that I think are not Sidshas. The following, reading, eating, brushing your teeth, or any other sorts of the usual grooming type things you might do every day, going to a job, cooking a regular meal. It's up to you to decide, like I said before, what, you, what constitutes a Sidsha. But to me, those are variously too easy, not, you know, not challenging enough. But if you want to count them, that's up to you. But I recommend making, putting a little more challenge in them or a little more self-imposed part to them. Okay, so how to choose a Sidsha? I'm a big fan of cold showers because I'm going to take a shower anyway to make it cold takes no extra time, effort, or anything. There's nothing. It's materially the simplest thing you could possibly do, a cold shower, because you're going to do what you're going to do anyway. It's just not touching one of the knobs. In fact, it gives you time, because I guarantee you're going to take faster cold showers than you take hot showers. Burpees, you don't need any equipment I've talked about. OK, so I recommend having minimal equipment. If you want to start a sit shot, the less equipment you have, the better, or the, that you need, the better. So generally, pick something in an area that you like, what you like. If it's in an, like I like fitness, so that works for me. I've always, you know, ever since high school, I've been into sports. Keep in mind the weather. If you're going to run every day, are you prepared to run in the rain? Are you prepared to run in the snow? Or are you prepared to buy a treadmill or whatever it takes to run indoors? Travel. If you're going to lift weights, are you going to be able to get access to a gym no matter where you go, no matter what you do? That's why I like a body weight exercise, because I don't need to bring weights with me. Also, culturally, if you're going to go to a place where running is weird, or meditation is weird. Are you going to be able to keep it up? So I don't recommend things like swimming or rock climbing, surfing, skiing, biking. You know, biking maybe, but a lot of these you need a pool. You need some. You need you need stuff that you can't just take everywhere. So if you're thinking about one like that, I don't. You can work them in if you. I'll, I'll say a second later how you can uh, work them in. Oh, I also want to. Here's a question I've not definitively answered for myself: Are sidchas exercise? I do not count burpees as exercise. That's why I still do my burpees after the marathon. I don't say, oh, I did something else. Now I don't have to do the burpees. That would undermine the whole structure. I don't care what else I do. I still do my burpees. So I count them as setting, I really count them more as setting a foundation for life more than exercise. I get exercise out of it, but that's not the point. All right, now I want to talk about, I had a friend one time, we were, talking about Sidshas, and while we're talking on the phone, he says, you know, Josh, Sidshah.com is available. So I went and got it, and I got Sidshah.com, and I had this idea, I want to make, I wanted to develop Sidshah.com into a site that would get people, help people form habits. And that, that same friend was a web designer, I guess that's why he was looking at Sidshah.com. And I thought, I know, I'll, I'll make it, I'll set it up so that people can do Sidshahs together, and it'll keep them in touch, and they can compete against each other, but kind of play, make a game out of it, and stuff like that. And it turns out, that the site already existed. It's called lift.do, which I think has been bought by some of the company, I think coach.me. And it was eerie how exact, how close what they did was to what my vision was. It was a sort of case where you have, if you have an idea, I think design principles are just gonna take you to the same place. So I looked at the site and I thought, maybe this is, this is, uh, is this the same thing? Have I, has someone already beat me to it? And the more that I looked at it, I looked at the site and I thought, it's making it easy to start a habit. And it's doing all these little game things so that you can see your graphs and you can see how your friends are doing and it will give you messages and all this stuff. And the more I looked at it, the more I thought, this isn't what I was talking about. If you make a sitcha easy, if you make a habit easy, it takes away the challenge from it. And what really got me was that I saw this page on like how to start meditating in within the site and it gave this long explain it gave actually probably a solid explanation of like how to start meditating the thing is that there's plenty of resources out there of how to start meditating what this site was about was trying to put everything in one place for you trying to make it very easy for you and the more i looked at it the more i thought this is not what a sitcha is about this is taking responsibility away from you 
trying to make it, I don't know how to put this. I can tell you it was the opposite of what I was thinking. It was, it, it became repellent to me. And what, what reinforced it was that I said to my friend, are you doing any of these? And he goes, yeah, I'm doing 17. I was like, holy cow, you're doing 17 daily habits because I'm doing like two or three at the time. And it was like, that was really hard for me. So I said to him, you're doing 17 things every single day. And he goes, oh no, I've started 17. I'm actually not doing all any of them consistently. And that told me that site was about starting things. It was not about continuing things. It was not about making things a part of you. And that's what I found so repellent was that the Sid Shaw way of doing things is you do it and that's it. Making something easy implies that the challenge is a problem, but that's not the Sid Shaw perspective. The challenge is the core. Doing the challenge is what makes the Sid Shaw the Sid Shaw. I mean, obviously the SID and the HA too, but taking away that challenge takes it away. Giving explanations implies that what the thing that you're doing is is hard or complex, but meditation isn't hard. Burpees aren't hard either. You can do it if you just keep doing it. Now, you might say at the beginning, you're not going to be an expert at it. But given time, that's the whole point of doing it all the time, is you get expert at it through, through practice. Explanation removes your discovery of what this thing is about. I didn't learn how to do proper form for my push-up from people telling me and showing me. That would have done it faster. I'm, I'm not opposed to that doing it, doing that. But by my figuring out how to do it on my own, just through practice, it's mine. I feel a sense of ownership of what I'm doing that I don't think that I would have had if I'd had a lot of other people guiding me, not letting me figure it out on my own. So if, by contrast, here I'm gonna tell you the Sid Shaw way to meditate. They had pages on it, here's the, here's the Sid Shaw way. Sit still for a challenging amount of time. Repeat that daily forever. What could be simpler? That's really simple. That's very simple instruction. Is it easy to do? Not so simple to do because you got to overcome all these things. You got to rearrange your life. You got to make sure that you, you got to put that structure in your life. Now, does that have to be forever? Until you come up with a new SID shot, you can switch to another SID shot sometime, but you consistently do it. Now you might say, wait, I don't know how to meditate properly. There's all these schools of how to do it. I want to do it this way. I want to do it that way. I want to learn how to do it properly. I don't just want to sit there. Okay, you don't get it. Ask, look it up, take responsibility to figure it out. The thing is, keep up the Sid shot, keep up this, this self-imposed daily challenging healthy activity. And if you're not sure how to do it, if you think you should be chanting, or if you think you should be focusing on a word, or you think you should be focusing on sensations or whatever, read, figure it out, just keep doing it. Just make sure that what you do, that you keep doing it. And the side thing is to look things up. You don't have to spend any money on this stuff. Just keep doing it. I want to talk about the subtle value of the Sid Shaw concept. When I first started doing this, and, and this web page that I found helped me figure out the value of a Sid Shaw is, let me get, I'll describe it. The value is not in introducing the activity. So if you don't do burpees and you start doing burpees, that's doing burpees. Burpees are great. A, Sid Shaw, a burpee is a subset of a Sid Shaw. What's the value of the concept of a Sid Shaw? Sid Shaw is actually a category, not an activity. A burpee is an activity. Taking five photographs and showing them every day, that's an activity. The concept of a Sid Shaw is kind of a, an umbrella term to describe something. So what's, what's so valuable? Why do I think the concept of Sid Shaw is so valuable if it's not actually the thing? Meditation is a thing. I mean, when you're meditating, you're doing an activity. A Sid Shaw is the name of a category of things. The thing is that why don't people do more habits that work for them. Like, why don't people have more Sid Shahs? The thing is that there are not too few Sid Shah options. It's not that there aren't enough of them to go around. It's not like people don't know what to do. It's that there are too many options. They start to do one and then they hear about another and they think, oh, maybe I should do that too. And they start doing two and maybe they do three. And then eventually they, they drop one and like the structure isn't there. So if you just say, I'm gonna do burpees every day, there's a pretty reasonable chance without knowing the concept of a Sid Shah, there's a pretty good chance that someday you're gonna start doing, I don't know, rowing every day. Row, I got a rowing machine. Or you'll start taking, you'll start doing some other thing and then you'll drop the original one. And eventually you'll drop all of them. If you miss one day, you can miss two. If you miss two, it's all over. There are countless marketers pitching their ideas, their activities. 
it's, you know, especially if you're into personal development, especially if you're into professional development, there's lots of people out there telling you, do this, do that. It'll help you. It'll help you. The problem is not that there are too many. It's not that there are many that don't work. The problem is that many do work. You say, wait, wait, what's the problem with having too many? What's the problem with things working? The thing is that if you're doing one and you, and you buy into the other one being effective, and you should, because I mean, I believe that you should because a lot of them will work. The thing is that you'll fear that you'll miss out. I'm doing burpees, but maybe I should really do dancing every day. And now I, like, I feel I miss out. All these other things become distraction. And when you get distracted, you don't. that undermines the point of doing these things consistently. The value of most sidchas is in the sidcha part. Remember the Venn diagram, of the, that colorful diagram? That center point that all of them have, that's where the value is. Now, if you wanna learn music, singing or playing a musical instrument or even dancing will help you learn music. But if what you want is structure, it doesn't matter which one you do. You'll get the benefits of all sidchas by doing any sidcha. Well, for that matter, you can switch around as long as you keep doing them every single day. You can do lift weights on Monday, run on Tuesday, do burpees on Wednesday, take photographs on Thursday and so forth. As long as you know what you're doing and you never, you know, if you miss one day, you miss two. If you miss two, it's all over. As long as you don't miss one day. Now my cold showers I do every fourth day, but I do it without fail. So, you know, the daily I sometimes, as long as it's very, very consistent and you don't let yourself take a break. Okay, so if you have one, you don't have to worry about missing out on another. That is the value of a sidcha. That is the value of the concept of sidcha is that it tells you as long as you're doing one, you don't have to worry about missing out on any others. So for example, when I, when I did meditation, the instructor said he meditates two hours every day. He does it before he get, or after he gets up in the morning and before he goes to sleep at night. He was saying, meditate two hours every day. I'm, I'm sure that works for him. I'm glad it does, but I'm not gonna sacrifice two hours of my day for it. It, it didn't fit in with what I wanted to do. So the, and Marshall Goldsmith, who is one of my mentors, and I've, I speak very highly of him, he recommends six daily questions. And I recommend six daily questions too, if you're not doing something else. The value of a sidcha, or I should say, if I could magically stop time, if someone said, Josh, you can get 25 hours in a day, everyone else still only has 24, but you get 25. And the way you can, but you can only do it by doing meditation. I'd say, sure, I'd rather have the extra day. I'd rather have the bonus day. But right now I can't do that. So I don't have the time to do those things. The Sidcha, Sidcha idea lets you say to someone who says you should do this all the time, say, no, thanks. I got a Sidcha already, or I got two already. And now I hear Marshall tell me I should take I, to do six questions every day. But I know that the main benefit comes from just any Sidcha. Not, he's saying all these benefits come from the six questions. And the meditation guy is saying all these benefits come from meditation. Well, some come from meditation, but most of it comes from just the Sidcha part of it. So I'm doing my burpees. I'm not miss, I don't feel I'm missing out on anything else because I got almost all the benefit that they're talking about. So that's why I can talk about Sidchas to you guys and not feel like I'm distracting you from other things. I'm not telling you what to do. You, it's up to you to do it or not, but you can do a Sidcha and not miss out on anything else. So you can switch, you can do a different one every day, like I mentioned. So recent advice to a friend. All right, I'm getting close to wrapping this up. This was the, 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 the friend and, and reader who wrote me and suggested doing this topic. He said, I think another great topic to have a webinar about is establishing Sidchas. I know their favorite topic of yours and it has proven to be a difficult exercise for me. Often I will be able to maintain a habit regularly for a month or so, but I'm noticing my current practices, meditation, waking up early and writing, have started pretty good, but become infrequent by the end of the month. Isn't 60 days about the point where they're supposed to feel more natural than be consuming willpower? So first I'll mention, if you guys, write, whoever writes me and, and suggests something, there's a good chance that I'll follow up with a, with a webinar. If you're getting value out of this one, by all means, write. All right, so you know, I've heard various places, like I've heard that if you do something for 27 days, that's when it starts to pick up. He was thinking maybe 60, different people have different research numbers. I've read lots of things about how to pick up habits easier. Okay, those are great. Those are lots of research things. I've heard of these things, but at no time, when I did those 30 days for my burpees at the, at the beginning, I had no idea. I just picked 30 days arbitrarily. There's no research suggesting that. And when I said, when I started doing the, the, the blog, also, I had no idea that this was going to pick up for years. 
I believe that action and experience beat research and analysis any day. Doing stuff and experiencing it and knowing what it's like to do something day after day, you learn for yourself what it takes to pick up a habit. I don't know what this, I've read this research. I see this stuff that people use, but starting a habit is the best way to learn how to start a habit. Research and analysis lower self-awareness. I have lots of people saying, this is what it takes, people tell me what it's like to start a habit. And when I ask them if they have any habits, they don't have any habits, anything beyond, not, not, you know, not Sid Chas. they might have like brushing their teeth every day. And they're telling me they've read this research and they're telling, they're telling me that what they know about starting a habit and they haven't actually started a habit. That's abstract information. That's not personal experience. In, and more to the point, they have low self-awareness. They have awareness of this abstract stuff, but they don't know about themselves. A Sidcha teaches you about yourself. Sidchas raise your self-awareness. So I wrote back to him these words in the email. I said, in my experience, they never stop requiring willpower, at least not the burpees. Every set takes willpower to start. I want to repeat that. Every single set. I've done over 70,000 burpees. Every single time I do them, it's hard. Continuing. So while you could say that they take infinity days to feel comfortable, if they don't feel comfortable yet, and I don't think, and they haven't started becoming any more comfortable, it takes infinity. If he thinks it takes 60, I think it takes infinity days for them to get easy. I would say a Sid for me becomes a Sid not on day 60, but on day one. That's all there is to it. I just don't stop doing them. To me, either you start a Sid and it's a Sid or you don't. So you guys did one. You guys could consider this the first of, you, of your Sid Chas. And you might want to switch away from burpees. That's up to you. But at least now you've done day one. It doesn't get easy at day, it doesn't get easier at day 60. It doesn't get easier at day 120. It doesn't get easier after year five. It's always a challenge. And besides, even if it wasn't a challenge, oh, I should mention wishing for others' discipline, wishing that you had the discipline that other people had, looking at Arnold and saying, oh, he can do it because he's, he's got that thing that Arnold has. And if I had it, I would too, but I don't, so I can't. From my perspective, that's just waiting for to have the discipline that others have is just making the, to make them easy. That's just excusing compla complacency. Now, if you don't want to do a sit shot, if you don't want to do some pick up a habit, that's fine. That's your values. But if you do, if you do want to pick up a habit, and you give yourself excuses for not doing it, that's what I call excusing complacency. If you don't want the habit, that's fine. I'm not telling you to do a sit shot. But if you want to do a sit shot. Saying other people have something that I don't, that's, that's just excusing complacency. And I uh, respect to my friend who, who I'm saying that to directly. Besides, even if a Sid Shah does become easier, then it, becomes, it stops being a Sid Shah. It becomes a Sid Ha without the C. So if something starts becoming easy, you've got to increase the challenge. That's why I'm doing 52 a day, plus the stretching, plus the abs, plus the back. That's why I do over five times more than I started with well over five times more. So wrapping up, I can't tell you exactly what you'll get if you adopt a Sid Cha. Only you will be able to figure that out. Only you will experience that. But I know that if you kind of do one, you won't get much if you kind of do it. Same if you start and stop. But I guarantee that if you keep one up, if you keep up a Sid Cha for a long period of time, and even when you finish it, if you stop doing it at some point, you pick up another Sid Cha so that you never stop doing Sid Cha's you will grow in ways beyond your expectations or your dreams. So I'm going to close with an unsolicited email that I got from an NYU student a little while ago. Not even a student of mine. He's a student that I interacted with, and I gave, some, gave him some advice. I got this email from him just after starting my Inc., uh, getting my gig writing for Inc., which, oh, that's, I didn't even think of mentioning that. How did I get a gig writing for Inc. Magazine? A lot of people want to write for Inc. Magazine. Writing every day for five years? I'm pretty sure they looked at that and said, this guy's a consistent writer. I think we can count on him writing for us because they want people to write consistently. I don't have any journalism background, but I write consistently. And I know what I'm writing about because I've explored these ideas because I write so much. Okay, so here's what he wrote. He said, hi, Professor Spodek. I just saw your post from a few days back and wanted to congratulate you on recently becoming a columnist for Inc. Magazine. I've been following your blog since freshman year and have noticed a definite change in my behavior, chiefly from reassessing the models I've been Okay, he talks about mental models because I read about mental models a lot and beliefs that I've been using to connect with others as well as acting more in line with my values as opposed to those of others. I love that, but it goes on. But I think all of that pales in comparison to starting my own Sid Shah. 
I've been consistently going to the gym and working out for over a year now. Aside from the physical improvements I've seen, I feel like a different person. I attribute that to commitment and discipline on top of the psychological aspects of heavy strength training. It's profound how one Sidsha has formed the foundation of others I've similarly followed for months. Mobility, tracking my food intake, and meditation to name a few. It's really opened my eyes to the value of consistently doing something as opposed to intellectualizing or rationalizing it. So with that, I say enjoy your Sidshahs. I hope this had an effect on you. I hope you keep it up. I'd love to hear back from you if you do, especially if any of you 30 days from now write me. It will make me feel great to say, Josh, I've done it, or even Josh, I haven't done it. Especially if you say, Josh, I'd love to, you can repost this on your blog because I'd love for other people to benefit from people, from what the other people have benefited, from what other people have done. So enjoy your Sidshahs. Thank you. If you have any questions, post them up. I didn't really, this was kind of me just talking for a long time. I'm happy to take questions if you guys post them in the, in the space here. I'll talk for a little bit so that if you have stuff to write, I know it takes a little while. Alan, uh, you're, you're, you're welcome. And yeah, actually one of the things I say at the end of a course or a workshop is that when someone's a teacher or someone's a mentor, or someone helps others, one of the things, it means they're taking their time out of something else in order to help you and I don't know if this is helpful or not. Only you know if what I'm doing is helpful, but my intent is to help. And one of the things that people value the most who are like that is one day to hear back feedback. I did what you suggested and it worked. Or even I did what you said, what you suggested and it didn't work. Or I heard what you said and it didn't resonate so I didn't feel like doing it. Anyway, all of these things, one of the most helpful things you could do for me is one day write back Maybe it's a day from now, maybe it's a week from now, maybe it's a year from now, I don't know. And just say, Josh, that thing worked or didn't work. Anyway, that's just a little bit, giving you guys time to write. I think that if, oh, here's something, I've been doing a sit shot for a month and is building a new foundation for my life. How do you know when it's time to increase the difficulty? So someone who does exercises. You know, that's interesting, because for me, when I do my burpees, I went from 10 to 11, 11 to 12. It was always a, a challenge, okay. There's two ways that I would do an extra burpee. Sometimes I would go out and I'd eat a big dessert and I'd think, I wanna do some extra burpees just to burn a few calories. And I would say to myself mentally, I'm just gonna add one or two extra burpees this time, just this one time. That's one way. There's another way that I would increase. And that's when I would say, you know, 17 is feeling a little easy. I think it's time for me to move up to 18. And that's a challenging decision because I'm not doing 18 the next day or 18, I'm not just doing 18 the next day. I'm not just doing 18 the next couple of days. I'm doing 18 forever. I mean, I'm thinking until I'm like 80 or whenever my body can't do that many anymore and I have to go down because my body won't let me. So for me, what happens is that I start thinking 17 is too easy. I should start doing 18 and then I, I still stay at 17 for a while until, so I might be a week or two weeks or three weeks that I'm doing 17 when I feel like I really could do 18. And at a certain point, I'm like, who am I kidding? I'm, I'm taking it too easy. And mentally it feels like I'm cheating myself or I'm slacking. And then I do 18, not because I'm challenging myself. Uh, how do I put it? Because I feel like I've been putting it off for too long. So in almost every case, that's when it's happened. I would feel like I've been lagging because I told myself I could do more. So mentally say, ask yourself, am I ready for it to increase it? If so, let that linger in your mind for a little while. And then one day you're going to feel like, you know, I got to stop fooling myself. I got to do more. Actually, it's funny. I picked 17 to 18 because I know that I didn't go from 17 to 18. I went from, I think it was 16 and 15 to 20. 16 in the morning, 15 in the evening to 20 in the morning, 20 in the evening. I remember that because I had a really big dinner. It was my dad's birthday and I took him out and we had a really rich meal. And I didn't go from 17 to 18. I know that I jumped up to 20. It was a big jump. After you've jumped a few times, you get the hang of it. So try it out, increase. The next time you increase, you'll do more. Actually, and I know that I don't went from 20 a day or 20 in the morning, 20 in the evening to two sets of 25 because that's when I was staying at my sister's place in the basement and she had a low ceiling and so I couldn't jump very high. And so I made up for jumping lower by doing more burpees. And then when I got back to my place, which has a higher ceiling than my sister's basement,